Good afternoon. Thanks for being with us today. I'm Mark Masechko with the Miami University Alumni Association. Throughout this year, we have been celebrating the 50th anniversary of the relationship between Miami University and the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. This Miamia Center webinar series has been a part of this celebration. Miami University and the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma first connected in 1972 when Chief Forrest Olds, having heard about a university in Ohio that shared a name with his tribal nation, showed up on campus unexpectedly during a visit to Cincinnati. What came of that surprise encounter is now a 50 year long relationship and partnership between the two Miamis. Today, we're joined by David Costa and Jared Baldwin for the sixth and final installment of the Miamia Center webinar series. David is the Director of Language Research Office at the Miamia Center. He has been studying the Miami, Illinois language since 1988 and working with the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma on language revitalization since 1995. Jared is a citizen of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and works in the College of Education, Health and Society as a Miami language coordinator. His primary focus is teaching the Miami language in the Miami community. Thank you both for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Language Revitalization and Current Language Work. Revitalization of the Miami language has been a priority of the cultural efforts of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma for almost 30 years and has been at the center of the activities of the Miami Center since its founding. The work of the Miami language revitalization falls into two broad categories, language teaching and language research, both of which feed and influence the other. In this presentation, David and Jared will discuss the language teaching and research agendas of the Miami Center, while also discussing the software programs the center has developed to support and link these two ongoing projects. Before we get started, I want to remind all of our viewers that there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So please keep your questions using the link just below the video screen. And now I'll turn it over to David. David, take it away. Hi. Um, hang on a second here. There we go. Uh, Yes, um, just wanted to add to my introduction. Like uh, he said, I've been working on the Miami language since 1988. Uh, my name is David Costa. I'm the head of the language research office here, and I've been working uh, directly with the Miami Center since 2005. And I'm going to give more of a discussion in my first half of the research aspect of this project, and Jared is then going to um, take over and talk more about the sort of community revitalization aspect of it. And I hope the siren there isn't uh, too noisy for people. It should stop soon. Um, to get oriented, I think it's important if I uh, define some of the terms that we'll be using. I know some of the people watching here will have heard a lot of this terminology before, a lot of these names before, but probably not all of them. Um, so hopefully this will make it easier to follow what we're talking about. Uh, the first question is, who are the Miami, AKA the Miamia? Uh, the Miami are an Algonquian tribe originally living in what is now Indiana and Western Ohio, though also at times in Southern Michigan, Wisconsin, and the Chicago area. And where is the word Miami from? Um, the name for the Miami in their own language is Miamia from a word that probably originally meant downstream people. Um, Miami is a shortened form of this, probably via French. Uh, and another term you might hear me use is Miamia. That's merely the plural of the word Miami, and it literally means Miami people. And um, some people will be wondering uh, the question downstream of what uh, is not entirely clear, and it's still debated among some tribe members. And then arises the question, where are the Miamia? Uh, I won't, other people in this series have talked about this in greater detail, so I'll just run through this fairly quickly. Uh, in 1846, about half the Miami tribe were forcibly removed from their original homelands in northern Indiana and settled in eastern Kansas. Um, most of these individuals were forcibly removed again in 1873, uh, moving to northeast Oklahoma, where their descendants live to this day as the federally recognized Miami tribe of Oklahoma in Miami, Oklahoma. Uh, the Miamis who were allowed to stay in Indiana mostly lived along the upper Wabash River, where many of their descendants live to this day. Uh, and at the present time, Miamiaki can be found throughout the U.S., but their main population centers are in Oklahoma, 
Indiana, and Kansas. What is the Miami language? Uh, Miami, aka Miamia, is a language of the Algonquian language family of North America. And as such, it is a dialect of a larger language um, called Miami, Illinois. What is Miami, Illinois? Um, well, Miami, Illinois is, a collect is the collective name for a group of extremely similar dialects of a single language spoken across what is now Indiana and Illinois primarily. Uh, this is a linguist's term, and I should say there was no original name for this subgrouping because the different tribes who spoke the Miami, Illinois language were politically separate and thus had no one single name for themselves. What then is Miami, Illinois? Uh, the dialects of Miami, Illinois are Miami proper, which was, as I said before, mostly northern Indiana around the Wabash Valley and western Ohio. The Wia or Wayahtanwa, which was originally, who were originally centered around Lafayette, Indiana. The Piankasha or natively Piangishia, originally centered around Vincennes, Indiana. And the Illinois. And Illinois is simply a cover group for various Miami, Illinois speaking groups, uh, mainly in what is now Illinois, though also in early days uh, in adjacent parts of Iowa and Missouri. Um, the main subgroups were the uh, Paywalia or the Peoria and the Kaskaskia, though uh, in the 1600s there were numerous other groups that just sort of drop out of the record by the 1700s. Um, the Illinois were first removed from that state in 1832, um, moving first to eastern Kansas, then to northeast Oklahoma, and they now form the Peoria tribe of Indians of Oklahoma in Miami, Oklahoma. And uh, the Wiyam Pieksha, who I mentioned a few slides back, merged into uh, the Peoria tribe. That's where their descendants are now. So what is Algonquian? Um, Algonquian is the largest Native American language family of North America, stretching from the Eastern Seaboard and the Maritimes through the Great Lakes to the Great Plains and the Canadian Subarctic. Um, the closest relatives and neighbors of the Miami were the Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Ojibwe. And so, in other words, Algonquian is a language family, much like other ones you might be familiar with, like Germanic or Romance or Slavic or what have you. And to give some perspective, um, this is probably the best map there is for giving locations of what tribes lived where in North America at the time of first white contact. Uh, this is known as the Goddard map. Uh, it was created by Ives Goddard in the 1990s. He, he is, um, worked formerly at the Smithsonian. And um, in this map, the sort of, the language family that's sort of salmon colored here, um, the one that stretches across Canada and the Eastern seaboard and into the plains, that is Algonquian. Um, so you see that the um, Miami, Illinois are directly below Lake Michigan. You can see that on the map. And there's also, like I said, it also covers most of Southern Canada and uh, the East coast. So as such, it was one of the biggest language families in North America with more than probably over 25 um, completely different languages. How recently was Miami spoken? Um, the last speakers of Miami and Peoria seem to have passed away in the early 1960s, though some speakers uh, who may have been fluent or may not um, apparently lived until the late 1970s in Indiana and the 1980s in Oklahoma. Uh, the problem is that um, at the time the last generation of native speakers was passing away, not a whole lot of people were paying attention. So it's not entirely clear um, how long certain speaker, how long speakers were still alive, and it's just mostly happenstance what we do know about this. Um, how do we know what Miami, Illinois was like? Uh, a common question is, well, if you people are not working with speakers, how do you even know this, um, what the language is even about? Well, we're fortunate in that Miami, Illinois is one of the most extensively documented native languages in North America, having been continuously recorded from the 1690s through the 1930s in written records. Uh, and indeed, the uh, documentation is so extensive that it's more than many North American languages that still have native speakers today. And I'll quickly talk about the documentation we have since it gives a sense of what our raw data is and how we know what we know, and also a sense of just how much data we really have been blessed with. Uh, there are two main periods of documentation of the Miami Illinois language. Um, it's handy to divide them this way. 
There's what I call the Old Illinois period, and those are manuscripts recorded by French Jesuit missionaries in Illinois country from around the 1690s through the 1720s. Um, and I'll get to these in a minute, but it's um, about four major manuscripts that survive from that time period. Um, then there was a period of about 70 years when the language was not recorded at all. And then starts the modern period, um, which is recorded in Anglophone sources, not Francophone sources like the previous, from the 1790s into the 20th century uh, in Indiana and Oklahoma. And that's what I call the modern language. Uh, Old Illinois, the language um, recorded by French Jesuit missionaries, um, the three main documents are there's Jacques Orgelier's Illinois to French Dictionary, uh, Pierre-Francois Penet's uh, French to Illinois Dictionary, and Jean-Antoine Robert Le Boulanger's French to Illinois Dictionary. And really quickly, just to give an idea of what these manuscripts look like and what's involved with working with them, I have, um, and I'll talk about these three sources briefly. Um, this is a completely typical sample page of Largelier's Illinois to French Dictionary. It's the only one of the three that is alphabetized according to Illinois and not according to French. Um, it was composed around 1695 to 1700. We're not entirely sure. Um, it's 587 pages that all pretty much look like this. It was probably composed at the Kaskaskia Mission in Southern Illinois, and it is now currently held, it's actually been at the Watkinson Library at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut for about 150 years, I'm gonna guess. And uh, I have not actually seen this one in person, but I have, we have high quality images of it. Um, this is a typical image of Panette's French to Illinois dictionary, which uh, might possibly be in the Wea dialect. Uh, the messiest of the three, I should say. Uh, it was composed in 1696 to 1702. We know this because the handwriting has been ID'd and we know uh, when precisely Panette was in the state of Illinois and when his mission was. That's how we know 1702 was when Panette passed away. Um, this was discovered only in 1999. This manuscript was at the archive of the Jesuits in Canada and Montreal for a very long time, uh, but it was only um, ID'd. It was not identified as any particular language. They didn't know what it was, and it was only discovered and identified in 1999. It's about 577 pages that look like this, and it was mainly composed at the Guardian, the short-lived Guardian Angel Mission, which is uh, near what is now Chicago. And finally, the third major Jesuit source that we work with very heavily here is Le Boulanger's French to Illinois Dictionary, which is a much neater, um, easier to view, um, easier to read document. Um, it was composed around 1725. It's only 185 pages, which sounds smaller compared to the other two, but the pages, I've held this manuscript, the pages are very large with very small print, so it probably ends up having as much data as the other two. Um, Again, like Largelier, it was composed at the Kaskaskia Mission in Southern Illinois, and it's currently at John Carter Brown Library in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and just as an aside, um, the Le Boulanger Dictionary is special in that it has uh, things other than just word lists in it. For example, this is one of the three pages of verb paradigms in Le Boulanger's Dictionary that they took down back in the 1700s. And... Um, there's three pages of this with very small print, so there's a lot of data here, and this was very helpful back uh, when I was doing my dissertation in terms of understanding the grammar of the language, working out how the, the suffixes of a language work. Um, now, sometimes I talk so much about the French missionary materials, the Jesuit materials, that people end up thinking that's all there is. I should also emphasize to say that there's also several modern, extremely important, and often easier to work with sources from what I call the modern language, um, the Anglophone sources. And as I said before, these sources start appearing in the 1790s, um, and there's over a dozen major and minor data sources on Miami, Illinois, but I'm just gonna briefly talk about the four biggest ones. Um, there's Charles Trowbridge's Miami Field Notes, Albert Gatchett's Field Notes on Miami, Peoria, and Wea, and Jacob Dunn's Field Notes on the very same dialects and Truman Michelson's field notes on the Peoria language. And so for example, here's a completely typical page from Charles Trowbridge's Miami field notes. Um, 
Charles Trowbridge um, worked for um, the state government of Michigan on sort of Indian affairs. And as such, he visited several Indian tribes that were in and around the state of Michigan in the early um, 1800s. And what he would do is he would go out to these tribes, spend a certain amount of time with them and record ethnographic and linguistic data. Some tribes he worked very little with, but some he got a lot of data from, including a lot of language data. And happily, the Miami <clears throat> were one of the tribes he got um, the most data from. Um, Trowbridge spent, lived uh, in the winter of 1824 to 1825 at a Miami community in Indiana. Um, his notes when he brought them back uh, amount to about 540 pages of these about 200 are on the language and the rest are on I, you can describe it as ethnology and history so his notes have, have a lot of priceless historical information we don't have anywhere else <clears throat> about 100 of the pages of the language data are verb paradigms and the rest are general vocab and example sentences this is a, again a pretty typical page and these papers are archived at the Detroit Public Library um, for a long time we were not able to use Trowbridge's notes very easily because all there was was a very poor microfilm dating to the 1970s. But um, a colleague of mine and I went to Detroit about four or five years ago and simply manually filmed all of the relevant um, Trowbridge Miami papers. So now we have very high quality digital images of all of it for the first time ever. Um, briefly, these are Albert Gatchett's field notes. He was a linguist originally from Switzerland who worked for the Bureau of American Ethnology in the late 1800s and very early 1900s. Um, he got a lot of data from Peoria, Miami, and Wea, um, recorded in Oklahoma in 1895 and 1902. Um, he didn't publish any of it. Everything he got, he simply deposited in the Smithsonian and none of it saw the light of day. Uh, he got thousands of pages of data, and it, I would say the most important thing Gatchet did was he was the first person to collect native texts and stories. Uh, this is a sample page of one. This is a sample page of a um, culture hero story that Gatchet collected from the Peoria speaker, um, George Finley. Uh, these are the first native stories that anyone ever wrote down and not just translations of religious materials or what have you. Um, and these are at the National Anthropological Archives in Suitland, Maryland, formerly the Smithsonian. Um, Dunn's work is fairly similar. Um, Dunn was not a linguist. He was a very talented uh, avocational linguist, but mainly a lawyer who, despite his lack of linguistic training, actually did a pretty, pretty decent job of it. Uh, Jacob Dunn lived in northern Indiana, and he knew a lot of Miamis, and he was fascinated by the language. So he just, on his own, um, worked on the language uh, in both Indiana and Oklahoma from about 1907 to 1912. Uh, he got hundreds of pages of field notes, paradigms, and file cards. And more to the point, he also got a bunch more texts, very fortunately. And his stuff is mostly at the Indiana State Library to this day, uh, but also some of it is at the uh, National Anthropological Archives, the same place as Gadget's notes. And what this image is, I chose this deliberately. This is the... Um, Miami emergent story or origin story um, from the Indiana Miami uh, Gabriel Godfroy written down in about 1907 and the official native title of this was a Honji Kinduki Piawachi Miamiaki and this is the a short version of the Miami emergent story of where the Miami tribe was remembered to have come from where they first came out of the water so this is an extremely important text that we have and finally um just to mention this quickly, Truman Michelson was a trained linguist who worked for the Bureau of American Ethnography, which later became the Smithsonian. And he had a quick one week stop in Oklahoma in 1916, where he worked with two speakers. Um, he got a couple hundred pages of data with verb paradigms, kinship terms. He was the first person to really intelligently collect kinship terms, general vocabulary, and again, three more native texts. And his stuff is important in that he was probably the best trained linguist who ever worked with really fluent speakers. Before him, the people who recorded data weren't linguists and weren't all that good at recording data. And after him, linguists who went out to study this language were not working with speakers who were as fluent. So this is kind of the sweet spot of the best, most accurate data we have, though it's not hugely extensive. And it also is at the National Anthropological Archives. So now, now that you have a rough sense of what um, kind of data we use, um, what do we do with all this data once we collect it? 
Um, the problem is we have well over a dozen sources. All of the data is written in different and inconsistent spelling systems. None of it is in the official spelling system. And it's often very hard to find things in the original documents. It's very hard to look things up. Um, so we needed a dictionary database. So about eight or 10 years ago, a need was strongly felt for a single database in which all the documents on the Miamia language, thousands of pages, could be uploaded from all 230 years of documentation and where everything could be searched. So in other words, no matter what source was and how big it was, it would all be uploaded to one place. But there was no such appropriate database off the rack. Um, no other dictionary database program fits the language archiving needs of communities without native speakers. Um, there are a few dictionary programs out there for linguists, but they were designed for the needs of field workers, not people working from documents. So what there is out there are mostly decided, designed for people who are literally going out into the field and interviewing speakers you know, live and getting data right from them, which isn't really a great or wasn't a great fit for what we had. We actually tried to use some of these programs, but just were dissatisfied with it. And this um, thus was created ILDA. <clears throat> To fill this need, we custom designed the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive, known as ILDA for short. Um, and this is the URL for ILDA. It's public access. Anyone can look at it. And at the present moment, to give you a perspective of how far along we are, there are over 85,000 entries in ILDA, all of them searchable. Um, so now the question arises is, okay, we have this raw data. How do we take this raw data from paper to JPEGs and somehow get it into a database program? Well, the process, we've worked out a process over the years. The original images of the manuscript, we have high quality um, JPEGs of all the manuscript sources by now. Um, we take the original images of the manuscript and we line their num we um, page number them and line number them. Uh, we create a spreadsheet with all the data on the original page. So in other words, every all the salient data from the original pages is entered into a spreadsheet. And also, if the original glosses are not in English, we provide translations. Um, so in other words, um, we, we employ a translator who's very good with archaic French, and he takes the spreadsheets when our transcriptionist is done and, and comes up with English translations for all the French. And then it's at this point that actual analysis has to be applied to the entries. So for example, here's another page again from Largelier's Illinois to French Dictionary. And you see the line numbers on the left-hand side. And I think um, it may be cropped off, but there's also page numbers on the upper right. And that those are key to the individual entries in the database so that you can find the program knows where to find data. And this would take a lot of explanation, but I won't explain everything here. This is a typical spreadsheet ready to be uploaded after our transcriptionist and our French translator are done with it. Um, you see in the leftmost column, it says Panette. That is simply the name of the source. Then it's keyed to the page and line numbers and uh, that each word is in. Um, then it has the French keywords and translations of the French keywords. Then there is verbatim the original French. So that column right there is the translation of the original translation of the of each word or sentence exactly verbatim as it is uh, in the original manuscript. And if you know French, you'll see that some of these spellings are a little odd, but this was 300 years ago. And then column H is the original Miami Illinois word, again, verbatim as it was transcribed in the original source. And again, for the Francophone sources, and the later sources, this isn't necessary. Uh, we have English translations of the French to make it um, the database easier to use for people who um, either can't read French or who have trouble with the sort of archaic dialect French that's in these manuscripts. So this is this is the, this is the raw data purely as it's uploaded to the database, and once it's uploaded, um, this is what a page of an entry looks like before any analysis is applied to it. And so you see. This has had just the information from the original in it. It's got the original original target language. That's the word as it appears in the manuscript. The original gloss, that's the translation in, as it's in the manuscript. And then um, our translator's translation below that. Um, and you see there's still a lot of fields that are empty. Um, and again, this would take a long time to explain fully, but this um, should be seen here anyway. 
This is an ILDA entry after analysis. In other words, after I've actually applied analysis to it. The, when the spreadsheets are uploaded, I actually have not had any input on that data yet, except sometimes people, some of the transcriptionists will ask me, wait, how am I, am I reading this correctly? That sort of thing. But I haven't done any analysis yet. But this is an example of a page that's largely filled out, a data entry, and you'll see it's got the original target language and the top of the first page. Then the modern spelling is basically how is this spelled in the modern tribal spelling, standardized spelling system. Then in English translation and modern speech form, we have um, the entire a, a, a modern day translation of what the sentence really means, because a lot of times the sentences and the words from these sources are not translated super accurately. So you sort of have to, um, we fill in, in addition to the original translation, we fill in what these, what we think the words and sentences really mean. Um, at the bottom left, you'll see there, there is a breakdown of every constituent word that is in this sentence. In other words, every word is given in its stem. Um, what that word literally means uh, and what part of speech it is. Uh, the cognates field in the upper right is um, other attestations or other examples of every word in this example, you know, helpful examples for comparison purposes, either from other Miami sources or from other Algonquian languages, just to sort of um, help sort of buttress the analysis that we given. And in the lower right there, we have the pull down fields, the, the, the semantic and syntactic, and also later speaker and dialect fields that we've tagged. Um, as I go along and analyzing these things, we tag the data for syntactic features or semantic features. Um, and you'll see that, for example, one of the semantic features we tag this for is food. And the semantic fields we tag this for are, it's negative, meaning that there's a negative sentence, uh, negative verb in it. Um, it's a full sentence and not just a single word, and it has an iterative verb in it. And the point of that is if we flag every entry as they get analyzed with what they are semantically or grammatically, eventually when enough of that has been done, you'll be able to do wonderful searches on, well, let's just list every word in the database that has to do with, say, corn growing or houses or medical stuff or for grammatical things, just give me a list of every negative verb, you know. So eventually that will yield to being able to do some very powerful searches. Um, now I was going to discuss how we actually use ILDA on a day-to-day -day purpose. And first I would say there is the ILDA use for the Miamia community. A very common use for ILDA is queries on how to say various things from tribe members, language teachers, and language learners. Um, a lot of times, one of the main things uh, I do is I get queries from other members of the tribe saying, oh, we want to use la Miami language for such and such, and I'm not sure how to say it. And what we start the process by looking it up in ILDA to see, well, are, do they, does there seem to be appropriate examples of that in the database? Um, an example, we had a recent request on how to say welcome in Miami. This dated back to the conference that we had last April. And some ILDA searches gave the following results. So as an aside, this is what a fairly typical search result in ILDA looks like. Um, and these results gave us, after some analysis, a new verb stem we have, uh, um, which appears to mean honor, admire, or welcome. Um, so this is how we're able to expand the vocabulary that tribe members can use, that teachers can use, and so forth, just because there's so much data in ILDA now already. There are also um, more linguistic academic, academic benefits of ILDA as well. Uh, a huge amount of language data is now searchable for the first time ever, especially in the Illinois dictionaries. Um, and to the very best of my knowledge, this is the first time anybody has managed to do this for any um, 17th century or 18th century records of a Native American language. So I should say that this is actually very leading edge for this kind of thing. Um, Uploading this data has made it possible to research any topics much more thoroughly than ever before. And so as such, it's been extremely helpful for my studies of how the Miami language works and for um, myself and the other linguists in the department in the center for writing research papers. And you could find examples, more and better examples than it's ever been possible to do before. Finally, there is still much left to do. Um, several data sources still need to be uploaded. Um, but the main work left is the remaining analysis to be done. 
Um, as you can probably guess, uh, the uploading of due data proceeds much more quickly than my ability to analyze it. Um, so every few months, um, several thousand more words are uploaded, and I certainly cannot do several thousand words in that same time period. Um, thus, the, while the great majority of the data in ILDO, while searchable, is still isn't analyzed, it's still incredibly useful before it's analyzed, but the database won't uh, really receive, won't really acquire its full potential until the data is, more of the data is analyzed. But the process of analyzing all the data in ILDO will easily take decades to come for myself and for other linguists working for the center, such as Hunter Lockwood, who has recently joined us. So that's a multi-decade process of analyzing everything. Um, and that is all I had to say now. And this is the point at which we could transition to uh, Jared Baldwin's half of the talk. <clears throat> well, I achake it to pay with Neil Lockakoke. Chinguia Wayne's Wiane, Nehilit Nehila Miamia, Tawenge Nepongia. Um, Minutiane, Kanzenze Sipionge, Nehesa, uh, Mehkimiane, Waha, Miamia, Nepoyona, Kaninge. <clears throat> so, hi everyone. My name is Jared Baldwin. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Miami tribe and I've been involved in the Miamia community for most of my life. And um, upon graduating, I, I decided to continue that work. And so, I work um, here at Miami University in the College of Education, Health, and Science for and society for um, as a Miamia language coordinator. A lot of what I do is related to language teaching. So um, I teach the language in the community and that's online as well as in person um, at, at various events, as well as um, classes here on campus with uh, Miami tribe students, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a little bit. And, and also part of that is developing these programs and developing resources for the programs and for the community in general. So I graduated from Miami University in 2013 uh, with a degree in anthropology. And then I here recently I graduated, I went to uh, University of Hawaii, Manoa for two years to get my master's degree in second language studies. And that, that degree really helped me focus on how people learn a second language and how to teach a second language. <clears throat> And currently, I'm working working at Miami University in the Bonham House, and I'm living in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I have a nice little commute there. But if you want to go back to my slides, we can we can get started. All right. So David did a really great job introducing kind of the uh, historical context and a lot of the linguistic work that we're doing now. Uh, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is kind of bring that into a more community focused. <clears throat> Um, the, the more community focused section of this presentation. So first I want to look at the, the context. So um, the, the Miami community is spread out all across the United States and there's almost 7,000 citizens and around uh, throughout 49 states. And uh, there's about 500 plus daily language users. And I say that that phrase daily language users specifically. Um, as David mentioned, we don't have any fluent speakers. We've been working from documentation and that in and of itself takes a, uh, takes a lot of, um, takes a lot of work to, um, to do. There, there's no fluent speakers to, to go to. And, um, so what ends up happening is a lot of this linguistic work, like David was talking about, is funneled through these these uh, this software that we've created, and then it gets pushed out through um, some of the resources and the language programs that I'll talk about. So um, the the community didn't start really revitalizing the language till about thirty years ago, and that started in the home. And so thirty years ago, there were no language speakers, there were no Miyama language users. Um, so quick, um, quick side note, this is the wrong presentation, um, uh, JJ, is it too late to upload? I don't know how, 
Hey, Jared. Um, yeah, let's try to let's try to fix that real quick. If you want to um, remove yeah. that. Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, no problem. As a backup, if that doesn't work quickly, if was David's all the David's was right fine, but that one was was the. Um, I'm not sure. That's good. So if I delete this, remove from studio. Yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. Then it should be present, add slides, and hopefully that works. It says you can only upload up to two slide decks. So delete the. Um, I did, yeah. From the. Sorry about this. Let me uh, download. And Jared, as a backup, if you want to, if, if that doesn't end up working, you could also email them to me and I can share them for you. Okay. Um, I'll, I tried to download it onto my. Can I um, share this? Sorry, can you give me your email real quick? Yes, yeah, Slager JJ, S L A G E R J J, at Miami O H dot edu. I, I shared you the um, the slides on okay. Google Slides. Is that is that going to work? That should be fine. One moment. Good time for um, people. If you have any questions to think about, uh, well, David and Jared will answer at the end. Please go ahead and share those, and I'll see if I can get this up and running for you. Okay. Yeah, so while he's getting that set up, I'll just <clears throat> briefly mention the um, uh, the context for how the revitalization effort started was in the home. And one of those homes was the one that that I grew up in. And a lot of the a lot of the work done started very focused on um, me and my uh, my older sister and, and two younger siblings as we were growing up. Are you going to be yeah, yeah, this is yeah, so yeah, sorry to interrupt. You can keep going, but just um I'll just let me know when to switch slides, I suppose. Yep. Yeah, so uh if you want to go to the next slide. Oops. <laughs> yeah, so this um this started, so this is a picture of myself and my my older sister um, doing some audio files. This was kind of in the beginning stages of the the community side of the effort. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the language knowledge really came from my parents as well as what they taught us. Um, the the four of us kids, um, they they homeschooled us, which I think was a pretty key thing here. And as you can see with this this image, a lot of what a lot of what my mom did, she's the one who chose to homeschool us was create these little um, these little stories. So this this little story here actually comes from the documentation that David was just talking about. This is one of those stories that we found in there. And then we turned that into a little a little skit slash um, image. If you want to click next again. And then we would also do things like uh, have little uh, competition. So they would they would have us do uh, what we called the penny game, which was, you know, as kids, we 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 were a little bit competitive as siblings and so we each had our own uh, little penny jar and when uh, we would catch one or the other saying it saying a word in english that we knew they knew in Miami, we would get to call them out on it and then we would get to steal a penny from their jar and put it into our own so little competitive things that really got us in the family engaged in using the language. Uh, this other image is one of my younger sisters. She used 
uh, my mom created this, this kind of body chart where we had a, uh, all the different body parts, both inside and outside. And we would do a body matching game where we would match the Miami word with the, with the specific body part. So all of this that we started in the home was coming from the documentation that David was, was talking about. Um, and, and this stayed in the home for a while, but, but over, over time we realized there was kind of a community context to it. And so it slowly started transitioning to the community. So if you want to go to the next slide, <clears throat> it started, it started pretty small. Um, there was, there was a really there was a really kind of pivotal moment in, in 2005 where uh, we started what was called A1 Zapata. And you can click next. And uh, just go ahead and pull up all the all the images. Yeah, right there. And uh, A1 Zapata, this was a summer youth camp that we started for um, 10 to 16 year olds. And we started it in Oklahoma, which is where the majority of our population was. And then we've eventually since then spread it to Indiana with the hopes of maybe more in the future. Um, as this started, we realized that there was a, a really broad interest in the community for not just language revitalization, but cultural revitalization. And so this camp really sparked this, this interest and the community wanted more. Um, they wanted, we wanted to learn about our history. We wanted to learn about some things like stomp dance, which is this picture on the bottom left. Um, this is a traditional intertribal dance that we would do and that we've since revitalized that. Um, something else on the bottom right is um, the Makasina Eyungi Mekindinge, which is the Makasin game. And this is like a little gambling hide and seek game. You would play it on teams. And um, there's a variety of other games, uh, as you see in the picture on the top left. Um, lacrosse is also a traditional game for us. And uh, we've been we've been doing a lot of work revitalizing that, as well as using our traditional um, sticks, which are our wooden sticks made of specific types of trees and bent in a certain way to create like a small round hoop, which is a little bit different than the modern day lacrosse sticks. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so as people wanted more and more of these things, and as we started providing a lot more, then the interest just kind of exponentially grew. And so as we were providing more resources, the community was wanting more resources. And then people were getting more and more interested in uh, actually kind of working as part of this effort. Um, since since this, this first program of Awan Zapata in 2005, uh, we've since added more. So that is for ages 10 to 16. We've added a zero to five for uh, parents and guardians of uh, Miamia kids who are age zero to five, which is called Keikinawita. And then we've also started a kids camp for um, the next age group, which is five to nine, and that's called Sa Kachueta. And that works alongside of A1 Zapata. And then there's also another program that's called Maya Hueta, which is for 17, 18 year olds. And then we have um, and then we have the, the unique program here at Miami University for um, Miami citizens who want to who wanna participate and go to college here at Miami. So if you want to go to the next slide, JJ. So <clears throat> this, this um, partnership with Miami University, and this is the reason that we're all here um, today talking about this, has been going on for 50 years. But... It wasn't until the until I believe 1991 where Miami where Miami tribe citizens first started coming to Miami as part of the Miami Miami Heritage Program that the university started offering. So that started back in 1991, and then it wasn't until 2003 when the Miami Project, which was which is now the Miami Center, when when that became uh, started to get the the tribal students on campus more involved. And at the time, there were only a few, um, there was only a handful of Miami students here on campus. Um, and since then, this picture I have up shows this current student body, uh, Miami students here on campus. And this is 40 plus Miami students coming from all across the, the United States. And they're part of this really unique program um, that, that allows them to learn about their heritage. 
So this, this program covers history and ecology uh, one year. The next year it covers sovereignty and current events. And so that looks at uh, governmental issues or, or topics in general. It looks at current situations and events that are going on, on right now in broader Indian country, as well as the Miamia community specifically. So we learn in that year a lot about the, um, the Miamia government, how our government is set up, uh, what are the roles and responsibilities of our, of our political leaders, as well as our cultural leaders those sorts of things. And then the, the next one is language. So this is the Miao Miao language. And this is actually the one that we're in right me, um, this year, the one that uh, we actually just finished up last night for the this semester's final. Uh, and this is really their, for, for many of them, uh, their first introduction into the Miami language. Uh, they, they would have heard it at, at tribal events if they have gone, they would have heard it if they grew up in these in these kids camps that I just briefly mentioned. But um, this is really a deep dive into the language to, to get them on a very basic level of understanding the language and then being able to use it. So um, their their time here at Miami with with their 40 other Miami Mia peers, um, in, um, infusing the language into that really has allowed them to kind of take take ownership of it and, and grow it from there and, and kind of feel like there's a, they have a responsibility to learn it and use it and, you know, kind of have fun with it. It's something that's, that's theirs. Do you want to go to the next slide? And then something else that, that we started realizing if, if you, if you think back to the map that I showed at the very beginning, um, our community is spread out all across the United States, across 49 states. And um, our issue is, if, if our goal is to, is to serve the Miami community, how do we reach these people in other, in other states? You know, technology is obviously a big role, plays a big role in that, which I'll talk about here in a minute. I'll talk about some, some tools that, that, uh, that connect with the ILDA archive that David has mentioned. And um, another way that we, we felt was necessary was to physically go to these places. And so back in 2014, we started community outreach. So we've gone to places such as Washington State, Kansas, and Texas. We haven't gone yet to Colorado and California, but in terms of population, those would be next on the, on the list. But it's important when you're rebuilding a community, revitalizing a community, to um, really connect face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, especially if people have never met you before, or may, they may not know a lot about their Miamia identity, um, going out, going to them and setting up a weekend event where they can learn about games, they can learn about their language, their history, and all these sorts of things has been really valuable and has encouraged a lot of them to start participating more in um, tribal events, events in Fort Wayne, Indiana, or um, Miami, Oklahoma, or other places that, that we have these large events. So this com community outreach is kind of twofold, you know, using the online tools in order to develop programs that work online for these, the, the people that are outside of the, the three major areas, um, as well as just going out there and meeting them face to face and getting to know them and connecting with them. So this has proved really invaluable to connect our community across the country. If you want to go to the next slide. So <clears throat> moving on to research and development, this gets into a lot of the work the Miami Center does, as well as the Cultural Resources Office at um, the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. So these are a couple images of tools, things that we've created. This image on the left is, a, is an image of the app that we have connected to um, this is a this is a Miamia Tawa Kane, the Miamia Dictionary app, and this has been an invaluable tool that we started creating nearly a decade ago. That has really come a long way, but it connects to the the ILDA archive, which I'll talk about here on the next slide. Um, but the the other image there is called Memrise. If you've heard of Duolingo or Babbel, these language learning apps that have become very popular. Uh, this is this is one of the competitors, and one thing that they allow you to do as a as a user and for free 
is develop your own lessons and then for your own language and then your language is kind of put through their algorithm for learners. So I've created um, multiple pro multiple lessons and courses on this site that go in tandem with some of the programs I've created. And so, you know, students, for example, here at my university during the language year, they use this for their homework. You know, I have specific lessons related to the, the course material that they're learning. And then also for the community at large. So we have a in the home um, course where if you want to start learning about and, and using language in the home, there's a course on here related to each specific room of the house. This uh, picture with a lot of other, a lot of other publications and materials, <clears throat> really, um, I, I put on here to show how many different things we've created over the years. A lot of these get shipped out to the to Nyanya community households um, as as we create them. So, for example, we have a lunar calendar, uh, which um, our our way of viewing. Uh, time and and a year's time in particular is different than the Gregorian calendar. And so what we've done is we've created a calendar that we send out to the community every year so they can start in tandem with the Gregorian calendar, start learning about um, how we how we view time and uh, being able to track it from a Miamia perspective versus a Gregorian perspective. But it's not um, they're both the Gregorian calendars overlaid, so you can still actually use it um, in, in today's day and age. You know, they, they both work kind of in tandem with each other. Another one is a ribbon work booklet, which uh, ribbon work is something that's, that's become very, uh, very common that uh, people are interested in revitalizing. And it's, it's kind of the, the aesthetic that Miamia community has. And so this was a booklet to show how to create ribbon work. Um, as well as talking about the history of it and showing a lot of ex historical examples of it. And then uh, lastly, uh, a, a storybook. So we have a lot of those texts that David talks about, those traditional stories that we have. We've put them all into book form so the community can start to learn these stories, tell these stories in their families in both Miamia and English. And that's proved very, uh, very popular for the community. So we, we do, especially in the winter time, we do a lot of community events uh, for related to storytelling. And um, there's a whole host of other publications and things in this image related to uh, revitalization efforts that that I won't get into. But um, there's really a wide variety of things that that this this revitalization has has sent us. Um, has kind of had us had us do just because the community has requested it. So, uh, do you want to go to the next slide? I'll talk a little bit about the the Mianya dictionary. This word is Mianya Tawa Kane, and this means the essentially the the Mianya the Mianya language thing. <clears throat> um, so, uh, if you remember, David was talking about this archive that that we're currently in the process of building and uh, adding Miamia content to. Um, one thing that we noticed uh, that we needed was something for the community. So that is very much related to research about the language and, and doing kind of a deep dive, very research oriented and linguistic oriented. But we wanted something on the community side. And so this image here is, um, the one on the left is, is, a, is a screenshot from the app <clears throat> And then the one on the right is a screenshot from the web page. We created a dictionary where the community can search for a word or a phrase that they're looking for, and then they can immediately access it as well as um, listen for the uh, listen to the audio of it. Because um, I don't know if you've you've noticed, but even though our letters are the same as in English for the most part, uh, the language itself does sound very different. And so, helping our community get over that hump. Um, has been has been a big priority for ours and and having audio on this dictionary has really been useful for the community. So this archive and the dictionary work in tandem because as as the archive is is filled out and David and, and his his coworker Hunter as they create and add these new these new terms that we find and they put them into the modern language, 
I can create that same word, put that on the dictionary, and then have that available to the Miamia community. So that's been very, um, very useful. <clears throat> uh, do you want to go to the next slide? And you can, one more picture. So one thing I wanted to end on was <clears throat> our, our language revitalization work has, has come a long way in the past 30 years. One of the key things that is of vital importance there is support from our leadership. So a lot of that comes financially. Our, our, our leadership supports all of these programs, supports our positions and things like that. Um, and then they also support it uh, through public encouragement and through um, you know, their family relationships. So this picture on the left is um, our, our five leaders of the, the community. So in the middle, I'll start on the left. On the left, there is second chief, um, <clears throat> Dustin Olds. And then next to him is Donya Williams, who's second council person. In the middle is um, Chief Lankford. And then to his right, to his left is Tara Hatley and then um, Scott Willard. The, the five of them support these programs, but then also with this picture on the right, um, their families are involved and invested in these programs. Um, this picture on the right is Chief, his, his kids and then grandkids. And all of them are involved in all of these programs that we that we um, have have created, and you know we're really targeting all of our, especially our young people, and and they they get to kind of reap those rewards for this. So this is um, an ongoing effort, this language revitalization effort. It's by no means done, as you heard David mention. Um, his his work, just his work alone, is has decades more to be done. So it'll be going on long past him and, you know, onto, onto the next person. And as is all the work that we're doing. So this, this dictionary work, as well as all the, the programs that we're in the process of creating and, and expanding, um, this is, this is going to continue on for a long time, but it helps to have leadership on board supporting this every step of the way. So uh, with that, um, if you can go to the next slide, I just want to say Mission Awa, thank you very much for attending. And I think from here on, we can take some questions, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks again, Jared and David, um, uh, for, for sharing the work that you're doing here for the Miamia Center. So we have had a couple questions come in. We had a couple come in before, um, folks that, that as they registered, asked questions. And then we had a couple come in here uh, while folks have been watching. So we'll start with, um, can we talk about how people can be allies uh, for the to the Miamia and other indigenous groups? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and, <clears throat> and answer that question. I think there's there's a lot of ways you can kind of show support for um, different um, minority groups or indigenous groups specifically, um, and a lot of it I think revolves around just learning more about other communities and just beginning to understand you know, their, their history and, and maybe more importantly, uh, what they're doing today. And I think one thing that, that I always keep in mind and I like to tell people is, is that we're, you know, uh, when it comes to um, Native American topics, um, a lot of it is talked about in the past, but uh, really we're, we're a people here today doing a lot of work and very much alive. And so I like to remind people of that. And I think having that knowledge uh, is a really big step forward in, in being an ally and kind of s letting other people know that there is that that you know native people are are still here. Great. Um, another question that came in was, um, where can we learn um, this phonetic spelling system? Um, in fact, this person mentioned that that's utterly different than phonetic spellings for the boomer generation. So, where are there spots that, that folks can learn this system? Yeah, I'll, um, I guess I can talk about that as well. We have a, in terms of the, the sound system, uh, we have a pronunciation guide on our community blog that I believe it's in a link below where you're viewing the, uh, where you're viewing this presentation right now. Uh, there should be a link there for a Miami language pronunciation guide. And you can, and there it, it, it's, um, you can go down the list and learn about all the different sounds and what they sound like in English, their English equivalent and things like that. Fantastic. That's a good first step. 
Yeah, and that link is below the screen here as you're watching the video. You can click on that link to see that. So, um, so I had a couple couple questions came in from Scott Shriver, um, and um, he has a question actually for both of you. So, um, so he asks uh, David, having studied some to some degree the grammar of modern English, I recognize the eight parts of speech. Are there any recognizable parts of speech in the Miamia language not existing in English? Uh, yeah, that is an excellent question, and the answer is yes, there absolutely are. There are parts of speech in Miamia that are not reflected in English, and vice versa. There's parts of speech in English that simply don't occur in Miamia. Um, the thing to emphasize here is that Miamia, along with all the other Algonquian languages, is structurally very, very different from any Western language. Uh, it really does not work at all like European language would be familiar from European languages which is part of the challenge of trying to figure out how its grammar has worked. Um, so for example, uh, Miami does not have anything you would call adjectives, uh, nor does it have anything that you would call articles, or there's no uh, words for things like the or a uh in Miami. However, there are other things that are in Miami that there's no English analog for. There's a thing called pre-nouns, which is, are these little descriptive words that come immediately before nouns, which kind of, a little bit do what adjectives do in English, but not exactly. Um, there's a thing called preverbs, which are little modifiers that come right before verbs and uh, which modify um, the action of verbs. Um, and there's also a bunch of a class of little grammatical par particles that the language have that always appear as the second thing in the sentence. Um, you know, these mark things like the future and things like uh, hypothetical action and things like that. And all you can say about where they come in sentences is whatever the first thing is, they come right after that. Um, so Miamia is a very different in structure. I mean, it's much more verb heavy than English. English makes much greater use of nouns than Miami does. Um, Miami, about 90% of the grammatical action in the language, so to speak, is basically with verbs. And verbs can be consist of several multiple parts and can actually be an entire sentence. So Fantastic. Um, so Scott also asked Jared specifically for you, um, is it acceptable for a non-Miami individual to learn and speak the language without being invited to do so, or might that be considered as a form of cultural appropriation? I wouldn't want to unintentionally offend by assuming to speak an indigenous language. Similarly, I guess I would avoid constructing and wearing a traditional piece of cultural apparel without being invited to do so. Your advice? Yeah, that's a really good question, Scott. <clears throat> Um, and we've gotten this a lot, especially from friends who are not Miamia um, and, you know, new Miamia students who, whose friends are interested in speaking it and things like that. Uh, I, we, we very much um, promote our language, our, our dictionary and things are, are public. We don't try to, there are, there are some aspects of our culture and of our language that we hide, um, that we kind of keep internally. But um, from, from our view and from my view in particular, uh, I, I really enjoy hearing other people using it and speaking it. I think when you're talking about cultural appropriation, I think where that gets um, gets a little murky is when, you know, if you if you were to start claiming that you were Miamia when maybe you weren't, that sort of thing. Um, but I think overall, um, a lot of my friends who, who are not Miamia speak and use the language, especially with me because they, they have a connection. Um, so I think a lot of it is based on having a connection to the community. Um, but but otherwise, I think our, our language is, is meant to be spoken. Great. Um, so Heather asks, um, which single state has no Miamia speakers? And that you mentioned 500 daily speakers. Are there an equal breakdown between children and adult speakers or are the daily speakers primarily adults? Good question. Um, good couple of questions. So I, if I'm not mistaken, the one state is Connecticut. So we have, so a lot of our community has kind of slowly moved west and west. So if you notice the, the list of states that I, I mentioned were um, going to go to or have already gone to, we're all in the west. Um, that's where the, the majority of our community is. And, you know, that could be for a variety of reasons. That's just kind of how things have worked out over the years. But um, so I think it's Connecticut. That's the one state. And then when I mentioned uh, 500 daily speakers, um, this is this is just anecdotal. This is based on my own 
very close and intimate connections with my community. And so it's really, it's, it's an educated guess, I would say. Um, and then to break that down even more, um, and, and I'll take a step back. When we started revitalizing, we really focused on young people. And as, as shown, when we started our, our first program, uh, it was A1 Zapatar, which is for 10 to 16 year olds. So as a result of that focus on young people, it's actually more young people. So I would say my age and below, so I'm 32. So my age and below who speak the language more than beyond, um, above that, that age. And so it's actually a little bit flipped. So they're mostly young people who speak it. Um, and then the adults, especially if they're still parents and um, they, they're a lot, a lot of them are, are still actively trying and, and learning, um, but they're also very much in support of the younger generation using it. So they kind of, they kind of support the younger people. And then, you know, my age, as we get older and older, then, then eventually it'll be more, more spread out evenly across the generations. Makes sense. So we've got a couple more questions and then a couple comments I want to make sure to share with, with you. And um, so uh, Burgundy Fletcher asks, um, can you talk about accessing tribal materials in libraries, archives, museums, et cetera? Um, I heard David say that field notes or dictionaries were found in the late 1990s in a Canadian museum or a library, and no one knew that they had them there. So how often is that still happening, things kind of being lost or misplaced or, or where no one knows they, where they exist? Yeah, that is a very lively topic of discussion to this day, because when I started out in 1988, the first thing I wanted to do was to find out if there were still speakers I could work with. And I made a few trips out to Oklahoma and Indiana and ascertained, well, no, it doesn't look like there are. So I started the process of gathering as many materials as we could. And from other linguists who specialize in Algonquian languages, they said, oh, well, the first place is there's lots and lots of language materials in, in archives, uh, unpublished stuff at the National Anthropological Archives at the Smithsonian, and also at the American F Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Those are two really big archives that had a lot of stuff. And so I've made a, a couple trips to both of those places where I literally just arranged to have copies of absolutely everything on the Miami, Illinois language those places have. But that was that's not everything. There's a few other things. Like um, I discovered the three manuscripts, the three French manuscripts we had. Um, fortunately, two of those were listed in bibliographies from like 100 years ago. Like So the one that's in John Carter Brown, I was able to find reference material saying that that was there. So I simply went there and viewed it myself. Uh, there was another dictionary that is at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we uh, contacted, I still haven't been there yet, but we contacted them and got a copy of it. Um, and for a long time, we were, oh yeah, and Indiana State Library has a lot of stuff too. I've taken about three trips there. Mm -hmm. For a long time, we were finding about one new source every couple years for a long time. And it was really gratifying because um, the more data, the better. Um, um, the way the Panette Dictionary in, in the Jesuit Archives in Canada was found was the person, Michael McCaffrey, who works as our translator, um, had a sense that nobody had really, he'd heard that that archive had a lot of native language materials, but it, they'd never been cataloged. And he simply went there cold and that's how he found it. Um, and I've since been there as well and viewed it. And we have a wonderful, like, super high quality um, scan of that. And I went there and helped them identify some of their other language manuscripts. but. We're still looking for new stuff. We haven't found anything new for a while. And the reason why this is a hot topic is because we know from the French Jesuit records, the Jesuit relations, that there were maybe about 10 or 12 different missionaries in Illinois country. And we, most of them wrote up language manuscripts. And we know for a fact that there's like dictionaries and grammars and things like that and prayer books that were written by other missionaries who were out there that have never been found, right? We just know this from contemporary things. Oh, they'll say, oh, Father Vivier has written a, gra a grammar of the Illinois language. And it's like, where did that go? You know, and it's because what happened was the Jesuits um, were sort of had to uh, leave in a hurry from North America and a lot of their materials sort of scattered. So we don't know. Um, the three dictionaries we have, the things that's the thing that's really ironic about the three dictionaries we do have is that none of them are found in the same place. Um, and 
Oddly, none of the three dictionaries we do have are mentioned in the archives, the Jesuit relations. In other words, the Jesuit relations mention lots of manuscripts, but not the three we happen to have. Um, so the eternal question is, are there still other French manuscripts out there? Because I think that's the main place where stuff could be found. And where on earth would we begin to look? Hmm. Um, I mean, are the manuscripts destroyed? I think probably most of them are simply lost, destroyed, whatever. But we don't know that for a fact. Um, a few years ago, we made some efforts to contact some archives in France. There's about three um, Jesuit libraries that we knew have a lot of older materials. And it kind of came to a dead end. All three archives swore up and down that they didn't have any materials on Native American languages. And not being in a position to go there and look, we said, well, OK, and we had to accept that. So. So far, none of the sources that we found have been in Europe. We're not aware that anything on the language ever actually crossed the Atlantic and went mm -hmm. to Europe. So we're not really sure where to look next, but we're kind of cautiously optimistic that there might be more stuff out there. Mm. Absolutely. So we'll just ask this last question here. Kara asks, um, and this kind of, I think, is it's perfect, kind of wraps up everything, but what are some of the positive impacts that have come from the language revitalization to the Miamia people? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I can say that there has been a huge increase in interest and reconnecting in the community over the past 30 years. So, you know, I've, I've heard stories from the generation before me about how, how, the, how the community was. And then in my own life, I've seen the, the connection and the, the rebuilding of the community uh, drastically increase. So, you know, our, our annual gathering, which is our biggest event, it's in the, held in the summertime. And, um, when I was younger, it used to be, you know, 30 or 40 people there participate. And, and this is where voting takes place. So governmental things like that. Um, and now we have a huge new building because we, we host like 400 people and they come from all over the country. And the, the, the correlation there is that people have started reconnecting with their identity, with their Miami identity. And that gets them excited, that, that, that makes them want to participate because there is a place for them. And, and so you're seeing people from all over the country come, come down to these events as well as, um, you know, the connection here at Miami University. These students are coming through a very unique program where they're kind of building a strong sense of community identity and where they fit into the community as an individual. And so um, across the board, there's been a huge increase in, in reconnecting. And, and a lot of it is from the younger generation. And so you have that youthful energy. And so that's been great to see. So um, I think that's, that's one of the big impacts. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I'll just leave with it. There's a couple comments. I want to make sure that we, we made sure that we said these. So Burgundy Fletcher wanted to say, um, Mission Away for your presentation today. This was uh, so informative and inspirational. And then Kathy Branch Spicer, she's class of 1987, said, this is not a question, but a comment that I've immensely enjoyed this entire series. It has deepened my love for Miami University and increased my respect and, and for an admiration of the work that is being done to preserve and revitalize the Miamia language and culture. Thank you for sharing all of this amazing wealth of information with us. So um, it's been a great um, webinar series, and I want to I want to thank both you, Jared, and David, you um, for being here today. Um, it's it was a great webinar. It was so insightful, and uh, we so appreciate your time. Um, and as I've said before, this Miamia Center uh, webinar series has been a six part series. It's run throughout all of 2022, and all six of the webinars, including this one today, are available um, on our Alumni Association webinar platform at uh, alumlc.org uh, forward slash Miami OH. That's alumlc.org uh, forward slash Miami OH. So on behalf of the Miami University Alumni Association, thank you all so much for joining us, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Love and honor. Thank you for having us. Mission Awe.